Miss Bethany, drink some water. <laughs> There's uh, there's when you when you have anything wrong with you, like we're we're a mind, we're a spirit, soul, and body, and and things um, they go in connection to one another. And sometimes believing in Jesus to heal you in a situation sometimes means you have enough faith to hear that you should drink some water. Just using it as an example, it's you know feeling that there's a natural step to take isn't a isn't um, contrary to faith. That is faith. Like when you, when you read how they operated in the Bible, there was a, a faith to believe the word, and then there was a follow of a natural action. And so um, I just really felt that she should drink water in that situation. Um, <clears throat> today, believe it or not, we're going to talk about healing. Um, and as you know, there's uh, we've we've talked about just kind of this kind of a, a system of prayer that you can you know you can kind of be taught, uh, for lack of better terms. Where you know you learn to pray for healing for people, emotional, physical, whatever it may be, uh, and that's not what we're doing today. We're going to ultimately talk about the healing that comes from the Lord, but we're going to take a real roundabout way to get there. Um, and I just kind of wanted to give you a, a preview to where we are going. I wanted to preface that with, um, you know, this this path the Lord has had us on. How many people remember we talked about last week? Who can spit it out, real quick? Sometimes you got to pay more attention to the path. <laughs> Oh, that was Bible study. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, so this place. What? The dwelling. The dwelling well. place. The dwelling place of God. John fourteen. We start. Jesus starts to really paint this picture of the dwelling place, and we began to make this. Um, I, I've been building up to this for months of this difference between encountering God in a room. Um, like a service or whatever, and versus being a dwelling place where he lives, where he's inside of you. You don't just recognize he's there, you, he's in you. And kind of just to believe for more and more and more. We've been painting that picture. We've been building up to this path. And so I'm never, uh, and I'm never ever going to just abandon the path. Everything, as we discussed last week, everything is a stepping stone in the path. And this week is no different. In fact, what I've learned in preaching, if you're going to be what they call a spirit-led preacher where you are let the Lord lead you, meaning you don't have a, um, a calendar that you make in, in January for what you're going to preach for a few weeks, you, every week you do the hard, diligent work of seeking the Lord of what is for my people to, um, to hear. Um, what I've learned over the last years of doing this is if when the Lord starts to lead me on a particular topic, it either is about to blow up in somebody's life or a bunch of people's lives, or it already has it, simultaneously. It's, it's God is ministering to what he's done. So to get us to a place, remember, one of the prerequisites of this entering into this idea of the dwelling place was that uh, you didn't get to take anything with you. There was no baggage allowed. There was no other gods on this narrow road. There was, you know, we began discussing what those other gods would look like in our life. And, and we just said, you know, the good news is it only costs everything to get in. And, um, and, and that's funny. But then, um, and so all of these topics are all pointing to this narrow path that gets us into this gate. And so I'm going to go back and talk specifically about the dwelling place and some other ideas around that scripturally, specifically. Um, but two weeks ago, the Lord showed me a vision of, of um, Abraham cutting the, the sacrifices in half, the bulls, the goats, the rams, and, uh, and how the torch, the fire of God passed between them and initiated this covenant with him. Now, two weeks ago when God showed me this vision, I also knew that that wasn't that, 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 that was an invitation from him to go get something from that. And then I, um, uh, but I knew it wasn't for that week. So I kind of just let that sit in my heart. Earlier this week, Monday morning, I do what I do every week. I start and I say, all right, God, we're going to take three laps around the, around the world this week before we get to Sunday. Where do we start? He showed me that vision again. He reminded me of that vision. So I looked that up. That's in Gen 15. That's where Abraham's covenant is instituted with God. And um, I did what I what I always what I tell people you should do like you should be led to a word a scripture I read it and I read it and I read it and not nothing in Genesis 15 triggered the meter in my heart that is Jesus like so God will kind of lead me to a place and He'll lead you to a place and then as you read it you'll notice that something comes alive in you that's the Lord in you like something is coming alive and I read it and I read it and nothing came alive 
That's all right. Well, God didn't show me a vision for nothing, right? And so that's just a side note. When you see a dream or a vision or something from the Lord, um, know that it's from him, but also know that you might not know what that means right away. And your first assumption might be wrong. Uh, so I started to study this, and I knew it, it wasn't just the Abrahamic covenant. It was the actual institution of that covenant, the cutting of the sacrifice, the passing of the torch. So there's a lot of talk about the covenant, but very talk, little talk about that act. But it is mentioned in Jeremiah 34, which is where we're going today. I went to there, and I read it, and it's just, you know, that heart meter is just going crazy. It's so much stuff in it, and there's so much stuff pertaining to where we're at, where we're going, how the, the immutable nature of God. See, we believe, um, hopefully you believe, that God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Amen? Amen? And so that means that he never changes, ever. He has since Genesis 1 to the Revelation 22 nothing is going to ever change about God nothing and so uh, but what has changed radically is our understanding of him so we just keep pushing in for more and more and more vision of him him clarity of vision of understanding and so Jeremiah 34 this is a story that took place a long time ago but it's still applicable to us because we can find the nature of God in all of this stuff and we can actually, we, I can almost always show you how it translated into Jesus' walk in various ways and what he taught us. Yes? And so today we're going to be in Jeremiah 34. We've already talked about the kids. There's, a, there's three lines that jump, that jump out in this that are going to be very important for us to begin to understand the severity of some of these teachings. The first line, which we're going to come to again in a minute, but I'll just read it quickly so you know what to look for them. And I will give the men who have transgressed or broken my covenant, who have not performed the words of the covenant which they made before me when they cut the calf in two and passed between the parts of it. This is Jeremiah, uh, God speaking to the people in Jeremiah. This is 1,400 years after Abraham cut the calves in two and the torch passed between it. 1,400 years later, and he's talking about this. Now, it's easy to read that and think, well, they did that again. But we have literally no record of that happening again. This is, uh, I believe, as we go on to read, because it's going to make a rep another similar reference to Moses. Effectively, this is where God, you've heard me say before that um, there's, there's, a, there, there's, there's multiple covenants before the Lord between the people and God. And that God never nullifies the previous covenant. He just stacks them on top of each other. You've heard me say that. Jeremiah 34 really paints that picture very clearly. Uh, what he's saying in this line, and we're gonna, I'm going to read the whole passage in just a minute, is that a man named Abram, who was hearing the word of God and living by faith, he was believing it. A man named Abram who didn't have even a single descendant of his own, not one heir, but a man named he hadn't even received the promise yet that he would have an heir that would be that he would be the father of many nations. That's after this new covenant institution. But as this covenant was being instituted, as these calves were being split and the torch was passing, and as this covenant with God was making with him was being instituted, that all of his descendants who would walk in this covenant were also agreeing to the terms. Right? He's saying, the men who have broken my covenant, who have not performed the words of my covenant, which they made when they, in his, in his loins, passed before the sacrifice. Now that's a, um, I know you don't know where I'm going with that yet, but that is a really, really big idea. And what I think it's pointing to, we're going we're gonna to drive this home this week, is that um, when we want the benefits of these covenants, we sign up for the terms and conditions. These men in Jeremiah 34, which we're going to read the story in just a second, they wanted the benefits, but they weren't keeping the conditions. The next the other line we're going to focus on when we get to it, I made a covenant with your fathers in the day that I brought them out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. This is when we skip forward from Abram to <coughs> Moses. Um, uh, so uh, from, from Abram, he starts having heirs, and then it skips down a little bit, and we get down to the, one of the heirs being Joseph. And Joseph was the youngest of his brothers, and his brothers weren't real fond of him being the chosen one. So they sold him into slavery. They sold him off to slave traders who took him to Egypt. Yeah, 
his brothers who sold him into slavery to get rid of him, effectively, because of a famine and pestilence and all these things, they ended up having to go to Egypt years later, not knowing that he was there, alive and well, doing well. And they ended up ultimately leading all of their people into bondage, where they sold their chosen one into. Um, after 400 years of that, Moses comes and liberates the people. And after he liberates the people with the hand of God behind him, you know, with all these uh, plagues and frogs and all that stuff, they go out and they get this covenant with God at Mount Horeb where they get the tablets of stone, the commandments. And, and uh, some theologians, especially Hebrew theologians, they would um, they argue that had the Hebrew people at that time not panicked with the time with how long Moses had been gone had they had just waited in faith patiently that when Moses came down that the tablets of stone would have transpi transpired uh, not transpired trans transcribed into their hearts yeah and not just been written rules but it would have actually been put into their hearts which um, which doesn't happen but later on Jesus effectively accomplishes this very thing but God is rebuking them because he made a covenant with their fathers. Again, this is way before the book of Jeremiah is taking place. Way before. But all these people are walking in the benefits of the Abrahamic covenant. They're walking in well, all the covenants. Noah, Noahic, and Adamic, and Mosaic. They're, all, they're walking in these covenants, but they're failing to keep the terms. This is a very important idea. Another important idea we're going to run, you can read past it real fast. Um, if you're not paying attention, but it says, and then you turned around and profaned my name. In this covenant with Abraham, we get the Ten Commandments, the Big Tens. And they, um, and the high on that list is, you shall not take my name in vain. Now, I know you've heard me say before that um, that is not necessarily stumping your toe and saying God's name in vain, um, as we were taught many years ago. Albeit a bad practice, and you should never do that. That is not the high command of God. Like, I, to, to, like God is not petty. He's not petty like that, but he is intense. And in the top ten, it's you shall not take my name in vain. You shall not say you're with me and then do opposite. And Jeremiah 34 is a prime example of people who said they were with him but did the opposite. It's a quick line. You could miss it easily. We're going to read it again, though. So the big three. You pass between the calf. I made a covenant with your fathers, and you profaned my name. Everybody, at, was everybody at Jeremiah thirty-four? All right, I'm going fast today because there's a lot to cover. And believe it or not, this is a roundabout way to get to healing. <laughs> Zedekiah had made a covenant with all the people who were at Jerusalem to proclaim liberty to them that every man should set free his male and female slave, a Hebrew man or woman, that no one should keep a Jewish brother in bondage. Backdrop here, um, King Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, and all of his associates are closing in on Israel. They are, I mean, they are coming in, they are hammering, they're conquering their cities. It is a, they are under attack to say the least. And God comes and says, hey, while you think you're being persecuted and while you're crying out to me to stand in the gap for you and fight your battles, why don't you let your slaves go? Why don't you let your indentured servants go? Which is probably in their carnal minds like, hey, that's who we need to kind of do the work while we're under siege. But God's saying, um, he's come and he's spoken. They're probably not asking him for this information, but he's just, this is what he's given them. That no one should keep a brother in bondage. Say with me, I will not keep a brother in bondage. Now when all the princes and all the people who had entered into the covenant heard that everyone should set uh, free his male and female slaves, that no one should keep them in bondage anymore, they obeyed and let them go. Afterward, this is like the next line, afterward, they changed their minds and made the female and male and female slaves return who they had set free and brought them into subjection as male and female slaves again. Say with me, I will not change my mind. Therefore the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah from the Lord saying, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel. I made a covenant with your fathers in the day that I brought them out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage, saying, 
At the end of seven years, let every man set his Hebrew brother who has been sold to him and who has served six years. You shall let him go free. But your fathers did not obey me, nor incline their ears. God gave really clear instructions. And again, he's always demonstrating his attributes. In Exodus, when he calls them out of bondage, one of the very early things he gives them instruction on is how to let your people out of bondage. It's his heart. His heart wasn't, uh, he couldn't be for bondage and liberate them from bondage at the same time. Does that make sense? He wanted to set them free and he wanted them to be like him and set their indentured servants free. Amen? This is an idea they called Jubilee. Every seven years they were supposed to let them go. As we've discussed before when we bumped into this idea, we don't have a strong record of this ever actually taking place though. Interesting enough. Then you recently turned and did what was right in my sight. Every man proclaimed liberty to his neighbor, and you made a covenant before me in the house which is called by my name. Repeat, right in my sight. I know I don't make y'all repeat a lot of stuff normally, but this is important stuff, and it's a lot of storyline, so I'm hoping this will make it stick. Yeah? We did right in the sight of the Lord. We heard his words. They're clearly written in scriptures. There's clear examples. We let them go. We proclaimed freedom to our neighbors. And then you turned around and profaned my name. And every one of you brought back this male and female slaves whom he had set at liberty at the pleasure and brought them back in subjection and made them male and female slaves. You took my name and you said you were the chosen people of God. You said you were Israelites who were descendants of Abraham, the father, you know, father Abraham. You, know, <laughs> they, you said you were with me, but with me has terms and conditions. With me, I have clearly, um, I have already, dem it's like God's saying, I've demonstrated my attributes. I've made it very clear. I've given you the tablets of stone. I've given you this moral code through Moses. Like there is, at this point, post Moses, there's no guessing game to what's right and wrong. The only guessing game, the, the only wild card is, is as long as rules are simply rules, then humans will find workarounds. They always do. That's what they've always done. They always have. It's why the Mosaic Covenant couldn't finish the vision of God. Because it was, it, it was still just rules and people were working around them. Jesus came to put them in our hearts so we weren't just working around them. We were building ideas bigger than the rules to, to go with. Amen? But this idea about not profaning my name, God's saying, is a big one. Because, remember, by the time we get to Jesus, sneak peek, it's all about those of you who believe in my name. And we've made that about lip service. We've made that about you can live like hell Sunday to Sunday, Sunday to Sunday, 52 weeks a year, 50 years of life. As long as you say the name of Jesus, this is old doctrine, this, is, you know, this one's dying out, but as long as you just say the name, but that's not what that even means in Hebrew culture. It means you can't do anything that God has said. This is not who we are. Yeah? You shall not profane my name by turning around on my words. Therefore, thus says the Lord, you have not obeyed me in proclaiming liberty and everyone to his own brother and everyone to his neighbor. Behold, I proclaim liberty to you, says the Lord, to sword, to pestilence, to famine. I will deliver you to trouble among the kingdoms of the earth, and I will give the men who have transgressed my covenant, who have not performed the words before the words of the covenant which they made before me. When they cut the calf in two and passed between its parts, the princes of Judah, the princes of Jerusalem, the eunuchs, the priests, and all the people of the land who passed between the parts of the calf, I will give them into the hand of their enemies and into the hand of those who seek their life. Now, um, I know that there's a lot of ideas and doctrines out there about who God is and who Jesus is, and most of them just leave you more confused than you started when you have them. But here's, the, here's, the, here's just the, the standard of which you have to learn to read the Bible. The Old Covenant was struggling. The Old Covenant people were struggling for a greater revelation of who God was. The New Testament tells us that. There was a veil of understanding over them to some degree that only began to lift off in Jesus 
when we read the Old Testament, we have to understand that the prophets and the people, they were speaking the language that they understood the best they could. I, I, I think through the lens of Jesus, we could have worded this slightly different, but, but and then that's an okay thing to say because Jesus came and said, um, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Jesus was the perfect manifestation of the word of God. Jesus was the perfect walking um, demonstration, manifestation of the law and the prophets. Everything we can ever proclaim as truth about God has to be found in the person of Jesus. Now, this seems like a real harsh passage to make that case. God said, according to Jeremiah, because you transgressed my covenant, because you broke the words of the covenant, you have profaned my name, and now I proclaim liberty to the sword, to pestilence, to famine in your life. Yeah? Um, and I know that's how we produce these ideas about the angry God and this, that, and the other, and, and that's not healthy for anybody. But what is healthy is to see that in the Old Testament, by their language, by their understanding that, um, and by their application that they learned, was that there are covenants that have been made before them and that they have the, the right, the choice to walk in those covenants, but it's not unconditional. They have to keep the terms and conditions of said covenant or else they're no longer in the covenant. What comes with all of these covenants? Being with God who is our protector. God is our protector from uh, he is our protector from all things. He is our protector who carries us through, who carries us around, who carries us over. He is the fire in our heart. He is the protection of the Lord is a big deal. No matter what the tragedy looks like, the protection of the Lord is what carries you through or around or over or under or whatever. They have broken these covenants severely. They, they have not heeded the words of the prophets. They have done nothing. They have walked away from the covenant. And he says, I regret to inform you that because you've broken our deal, I can no longer keep mine. And he releases his hand of protection, conquering swords, pestilence, famine. Yeah, it's, it's a cycle. It's a cycle. How did we end up in bondage to begin with? We sold our chosen one into slavery. Famine, pestilence, wars depleted them of all their resources and hope. They had to turn themselves into Egypt and become effectively, eventually, indentured servants to Egypt. Yeah? These ideas are, they're, they're really buried and veiled in the Old Testament, but we're going to get to the New Testament in just a minute here, right? But this is a very important thing, and, and, I, and, and I know you're, you're, you're thinking, well, I don't have any slaves, man. That's a good thing. We're way past that in this culture. Um, but here's the thing. Jesus... If all the covenants stack on top of each other and none of them nullify each other, then what did Jesus do? Because a lot of Western Christian ideologies is like they don't even care about anything prior to Matthew chapter 1. They're like, that's Old Testament stuff. We're New Testament people. Great. All the covenants stack on top of each other. And what Jesus did was Jesus said, um, and I didn't pull these lines up, but Jesus said, I didn't take away one dot or tittle or not one teeth uncrossed, not one eyes undotted. Like, Everything from the law is immutable. Now, the Pharisaical law is different. I'm talking about the true laws of God, the universal laws of God, the universal ideas and laws that came from the prophets. Jesus undid none of them. But in fact, he turned the volume up on all of them. Every one of them got the volume turned up. Real quick, if that doesn't make sense, in the old covenants, we couldn't murder people. That was no good. In the new covenant... You can't hate people because that's murder in your heart. Mm -hmm. You can't gossip and slander because that's murder with your lips. Mm -hmm. See, volume got cranked way up. Yeah, in the Old Testament, in the Old Covenants, you couldn't cheat on your wife or husband. In the New Testament, Jesus turned the volume up just to scooch. Can't think about it. If you are, go to God. Get dealt with that. Yeah? Mm -hmm. He wants to liberate us from all things. All things. Even the, uh, some people say, it, well, he turned the volume up on some and did away with others. I, and they say uh, the sacrifice system he did away with. No, he didn't. He did not do away with the sacrifice system, not one inch. He turned the volume up. We went from an inferior priest who, uh, a bunch of inferior priests who were doing the best they could, but inferior to the infinite God that we have. And then inferior sacrifices that would at best be accepted for one year. 
He went from that system, this sacrificial system, got the volume cranked up to the dwelling place. The mansion translates to the manse, which is where the home where the priest, the minister would live. We got a priest called a Holy Spirit that's supposed to be dwelling in us, accepting a sacrifice that's called Jesus. Jesus never did away with the sacrifice system. He just cranked it up a little bit. He gave us a better priest and a better sacrifice. Yeah, it's still all part of a covenant. There's not one thing that got done away with. It just got the volume cranked up. Amen? So the intensity around bondage and bond servants ought to be noticed and ought to be thought about, well, how did he crank the volume up on that? And I'm here to make a claim for you to consider. Yes, we don't have tangible bond servants in this culture anymore. But do we keep people figuratively in bondage? Do the people who have offended us, who have hurt us, who have wounded us, who have scarred us, the, the, the priests, the pastors of the past that offended us or hurt us, the, 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 the whatever, the moms, the dads, the friends, the families, the, have, have we put people in bondage because they've hurt us? Because, you see, when we start using these words, um, when we start reading, we're going to read the Lord's Prayer in, in a little bit here. And when it talks about forgiving the debts, that word debts is not financial in nature. That word in, in that, uh, translate in that culture, it's sin-based in nature. Sin is missing of the mark. Forgive us, Lord, for how we have missed the mark of who we're made to be as we forgive others who have missed the mark of how they're made to be. It's a sin-based debt system, not a, not a financial system per se. We haven't got there yet. Quit rushing me. <laughs> so in this new covenant, it's something to consider. Is bondage that we have put people in or are in, is it, can it be figurative if literally every other natural thing of the old covenant got cranked up, not lessened, intensified, and turned into figurative examples. Just a thought. Amen? Jesus came in Luke 4, and he shows up in his hometown, and he goes to the temple, which is customary, and then in the customary, uh, in these customs, they would, they would have someone read the Holy Scriptures, and he opens the scroll of Isaiah, and he begins to read this as a prophetic declaration of the new covenant. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor or humble in heart. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and to recover of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. The acceptable year of the Lord, by the way, is what they called the year of jubilee. That's when they set the slaves, or were supposed to set the year, slaves free. The year of the Lord is the year they set the slaves free. Now, almost every other line in here is about the captives, the oppressed, setting the slaves free. This is the bold proclamation that Jesus made. Now, if we want to go back and study this passage, you could uh, begin to grab a hold to the idea that Isaiah wasn't necessarily prophesying about the Messiah specifically. It reads as if, when you go back, it reads as if he was prophesying of a time of the uh, uh, Messiah. A time of the Messiah where it would come on the people. Like where the people who were under the time of the Messiah would begin to have the spirit of the Lord was to be upon you. And that you would be anointed to preach the gospel to the humble of heart. And that you would be sent to heal the broken heart, to proclaim liberty to the captives, uh, to recover sight to the blind, to set liberty to those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. See, Jesus was making a proclamation for us, I believe, not for him, because Jesus didn't have nobody in captive. Jesus had no one to set free from bondage. He had no slaves. He was the reason that we would all begin to come into this proclamation and operate in this manner with the law of God written in our hearts. Is that exciting? Yeah. Are you starting to see why Jeremiah 34 may be more relevant than we think? Lord's Prayer, Matthew 6. You all heard me. Um, I love the Sermon on the Mount. 
That's Matthew 5, where we start with the Beatitudes, and it rolls on through 5, 6, 7. The, the Sermon on the Mount is just an epic, epic sermon teaching from Jesus. And, and, it's, um, and, and I, I don't think I'm alone in this, but many people would liken it to, this is like, this is like Mount Horeb for Jesus. This is where he's given us this like really clear, like, so you're not confused, path of morality or path to, in, to enter into a kingdom. It's also where we get these lines, like last week we talked about this, he get, we get these invitations to draw closer to these lines of like, this is not the easiest path to follow. There's this crooked path and this narrow gate that few are going to find and many are going to be on the broad way to destruction. It's buried in this Sermon on the Mount, but in this Sermon on the Mount, we get this, what we call this Lord's Prayer. Now, as we read the Lord's Prayer and think about that all the covenants are stacking, therefore we're agreeing to all the terms and conditions. Jesus has instituted a new covenant. Yes, he's amplifying all of the old ones. So just hear the amplification of everything that's ever been taught, um, but with this institution of, of new freshness on earth. Our Father who is in heaven, may your name be treated as holy. May your kingdom come. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Do not bring us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. The Lord's Prayer, and I also would argue that this is a more of a model of prayer, a, an outline of prayer that you should be uh, instituting into your heart. Less of a exact words have to be said every day, but a model. But let's, let's look at it through this idea of all the old covenants. Let your name be holy. Do not take my name in vain. Your kingdom come, you will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The only true liberty is in the kingdom. God's trying to get liberty onto this earth. He wants his children to be free in his name. Give us today our daily bread. The life of Jesus was the bread. Take and eat. This is my body, right? This, this follow me, this, this constant invitation to follow him, to eat of his body, to, to walk in the freedom that he paid for. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. I would like you to stop and look at verse 12 there, and, and you can make this conclusion for yourself, but it's written backwards if you think about the tenses and terms. It would have, um, it could have easily have read, written, um, as because we have, have forgiven our debtors, forgive us our debts. We like to think that we will be forgiven by God and that one day, we will um, forgive others. That's what we like to think, um, at least in the back of our minds. But it's, as we have already forgiven our debtors, please forgive us as well, Lord. It's the same old thing. God, when I have more time, when I have more free time, God, I'll give some to the church. Never happens. When I have more money, God, I'll give some to the church. Never happens. When I have more forgiveness, God, I'll give some to those around me. Never happens. It never happens because we have a covenant that says we are graced to go first. And that we, um, you can go back through all the Old Testament stuff, and you can see this one idea is really, really riddled through all the stories. We create a reality that becomes, we create an ideas around ourselves, truths around us that become realities. Yeah? So when, when their hearts were twisted and they sold Joseph into slavery, they created a reality that 400 years of descendants would live in. Think about that. Jesus came to, to, to reset reality. He came to, to start a new covenant. He came to institute a new thing. But this is, this is Jesus. And just so you don't think I'm reaching too hard on this. Oh, last line. Do not bring us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. That doesn't really line up with most of our thinkings of Jesus and how he operates. Why would we need to ask Jesus not to deliver us to the evil one? That's not his job, right? Jeremiah 34. We've broken the covenant. You've broken the covenant. Now, I'm sorry to tell you. I regret to inform you. That the thing that I offer the most, which is my hand of protection from the wicked world around you, can no longer be with you. We have no more deal. Now, I know that's a real harsh reality. And I'm not trying to uh, just paint a harsh reality. You know me. Like, I'm, 
I'm super in love with Jesus. I think he's like the greatest thing since sliced bread. And and like, that's figurative. He's way better than sliced bread. But, <laughs> but I'm saying, I have never jumped on this bandwagon of we don't have a clearly written expectation from God in front of us. It's really clearly in front of us. And Jesus does not do away with the Old Testament consequences for breaking the covenants. He just reminds us that it can still be there, right? He follows this line. This is verse 13, verse 14. Just so we're super duper clear about what was just said, guys. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. If you forgive people the debts, the missteps, the hurts, the wounds, the pains, if you forgive them, your Father will forgive you. Now, you might be thinking, he's a good God. He'd probably forgive me either way. Just so we're clear, Jesus doubles down on this, verse 15. But if you do not forgive men, neither will your Father forgive you. It's, it's almost as if he can't. It's a covenant thing. It's a covenant thing that he brings us into. It's why he pushes us to do it because he wants to be in it with us. I would begin to, um, I used to um, always read the, the instructions around setting the captives free. I used to always read that like, man, he really loves the, the captives. He loves the downtrodden. He loves those who are trapped in bondage, who are oppressed. And he really loves these people because he does. But you know, I'm starting to think he really loves too in this scenario, the people who have misled their lives and they had thought they could take God's people into bondage. He's trying to set the hearts free of the oppressor as well as liberate the oppressed. Jesus' commandments are constantly directed at us. And by the time it gets to him, they're more directed at the people who would be the oppressor in that scenario than the oppressed. He wants to set us free. He is the king of freedom. He's the king of forgiveness. We all believe that freedom came, that forgiveness comes through Jesus. Correct? Raise your hand if you believe that Jesus forgives our sins. That's the backbone of Christian ideology. Jesus forgives our sins. Well, I didn't want to present some radical new idea that would contrary to your beliefs, but I do like to read the Bible. There are some terms and conditions to this thing. And they're not just because he's a legal system. It's because there is a system and he doesn't want you walking through life not understanding what's going on. There is a system where we get to put people in bondage if we so choose. And, and, and we as the oppressor in that scenario, even if it was an, an atrocity done to you, you have to let them free because you deserve better than to be an oppressor. Amen? This is a broad idea that goes outside of just owning slaves. Um, Jesus brings it in and makes it a little more generic. He keeps on the same sermon. Just so we're clear, this kind of goes in every direction. Judge not that you would not be judged for that in which you judge. You will be judged. With the measure you use, we measure back to you. There's all kinds of parables about you thought I was an angry God. I'm going to deal with you harshly. There's these ideas that we forgive, we're forgiven. We judge not, not so heavily judged. Keep going. Golden rule. We all know this one. We learned this one in all the Bible classes. Therefore, whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them. This is the law and the prophets. Whatever we want, we have to give first. We give it first if we want it back. If you think that you're going to receive... Uh, now, God has like this weird thing where even when we're like really awful and we're super un, unsaved and unlike him in any way, he pours out this ton of grace on us. A ton of grace. All this love and compassion comes on us when we first get brought into this kingdom and this what we call salvation. It is, it's just this flood of free gift of God. And then that's what that's what they used to call the honeymoon period. And then there's this time passes. It's like it gets a little harder. And it's not because God isn't still good. It's because he's given us enough time to start to walk in the conditions. And there's a testing. And there's all these parables about when the, with just a little bit of time, there's a little bit of testing, a little bit of trial, and the seed withers away because it has no root and it goes away. You, you know that one, right? There's these conditions and there's these things and it all points back to all the teachings, every Old Testament story, everything points back to if you don't, Jeremiah is saying, if you don't want to be taken captives and stuck back into bondage, the thing that God liberated us from, set your people free. Yay, you did the right thing. Wait a second, you did the wrong thing. Okay. Like, 
I hate to tell you, but now freedom is released on your enemy. We have to take this stuff more serious. We have to understand that we passed between the calf with Father Abraham. We accepted the terms and conditions on Mount Horeb. We entered into a covenant of forgiveness with Jesus because we wanted to be forgiven. But he was really super duper clear that we have to walk in forgiveness. You have to walk in forgiveness for you, you could be upset right now with people who aren't even alive anymore. They could be grandparents and great grandparents and parents or friends or this. Like it could be anybody. You can be you can have people who aren't even around for you to apologize to in bondage, but you still have to let them go because you deserve better than to be an oppressor. Amen. You know why this is beyond important. We deserve better. They deserve better. The world at large deserves better than a bunch of unforgiven. Like, how many people do you know? How many times in your life have you thought, man, I believe in Jesus. Life ain't going so good. Things are really hard. I'm not saying that everything's supposed to be easy. I'm not saying that things aren't supposed to be struggles. I, I have fought uphill battles my whole entire life, but I felt good in my heart about doing it most of the time because I was good with Jesus. Yeah, it's not to say that it's always easy, but it's to say that it's not supposed to be awful. It's not supposed to feel like Nebuchadnezzar is pressing in on every area of my life, consuming anything that I've worked for. It's supposed to feel like the God of this universe is with us, and far be it for me to not believe what I can't even see. That's what it's supposed to be. Amen? And this weight of unforgiveness that we put on that we take on ourselves because we won't freely give what was freely given to us. This weight of unforgiveness is killing us in every way. And, and, and rarely is it easy to connect the dot. Like, when those guys took, set their ser servants free and then they took them back as servants because their hearts turned and they profaned the name of God. And then Nebuchadnezzar finished closing in and punished in and overtaking, conquering their cities. How many of them do you realize had, did not connect those two dots? How many of you didn't? How many of you realize that they thought to themselves, that guy Jeremiah is crazy. We need our servants if we're ever going to survive this, and the odds are against it anyway. And Nebuchadnezzar closed in on them, conquered them, and enslaved a lot of them, killed a lot of them. How many of you they never connected the dots, and neither do we in this system that God has so clearly put in front of us? You want to know why this is so important? Beyond just peace and contentment and you being free and the people around you being free, Jesus, countless times, this is just one example, I don't even know if it's the best one. They brought to him a paralytic lying in a bed. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, son, be of good cheer. Your sins are forgiven. Skip a few lines. He rose and departed to his house. How many times does Jesus take somebody who is lamed, maimed, defected from birth? He says, your sins are forgiven. And it outrages the religious systems. Like, who can forgive sin? But God himself. Well, he wants God himself. But they didn't get that. Your sins are forgiven. You're missing the mark of who I've made you to be is forgiven, my friend. You weren't made to be the paralytic lion in the bed. You weren't made to be the blind beggar. You weren't made to, you're missing the mark is forgiven. Now go and forgive. Sometimes Jesus goes first, but but it's it seems like in this scenario that like they're these these humble men and women of God are dragging like one time they tear a hole in the ceiling to get them go like these people of pure faith and humble and they're just they they're not judging their paralytic friend they're believing for more they're hoping for something they can't even see yet and they're bringing him and he says your sins are forgiven what if Paul writes in 2 Corinthians uh, or Corinthians he says that uh, you're because you're not eating the bread and drinking the wine Properly, it's why you're still sick and dying. Now, we some people preach that as the cup of death. Like, oh, if you're not right with Jesus, you drink this cup. It's your day. Well, that's not what that means. It means you're not getting these ideas of walking in the name of God. You're not getting this daily bread that Jesus told us to ask for. You're not walking in the ways of following the path of Jesus, which is forgiveness. 
which is not judging, which is, which is love, which is compassion, forbearance, which is loving one another, giving what you want to receive back. That is the path of Jesus. And if you're not eating that bread that he told us to pray for daily properly, no wonder, as Paul says, we're all still sick and dying. Now, I'm not saying if we can get our act together, nothing ever will go wrong. I, you know, again, I can't reiterate that not. We're in a march towards perfection of humanity. We're not there yet. We're nowhere near that. We won't live long enough to see it properly. That's not, that's not a lack of faith. That's just an awareness of timelines. But we are a people who are way further down than where we started 2,000 years ago in this covenant. And we are a people who have a lot more freedom and progress in this than they had. We have to believe for bigger and better things. We have to understand the damage we do to ourselves when we, um, when we keep people in bondage. He cannot protect us and liberate us if we are oppressors. Excuse me. He will not. He loves us too much to affirm radically disobedient decisions. He wants us to see what is redundantly clearly written in front of us, reiterated by King Jesus himself time and time again. Come be free. Come be free. All of that was because God showed me a vision of Abraham cutting the sacrifice and the torch passing through it. And then God showed me people being healed today. I don't always have to preach healing to see you be healed. But whether we understand it fully or not, our physical afflictions are tied to our spiritual afflictions. Yes, I'm not trying to bring um, condemnation on anybody. You know what I mean? I've had problems. I've had sicknesses. I've had pains. I've had lots and lots of that. It's, it, 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 when you're having a problem, it doesn't mean that you're all kinds of wrong with God. It just means, it, it, it either means that you have something is stopping the progression of healing, whether it's instant or rapid or whatever. Something is holding it back. I've seen, I watched somebody one time who had a lot of unforgiveness in their heart. I shall not name them. Um, they don't know here. A lot of unforgiveness in the heart. They were in their 30s and they slipped and broke a few bones in their foot and, and they had a broken leg, messed up. They couldn't even walk for like 10 years, almost lost the leg. And just got more and more and more bitter towards the world around them. Now, I can't say for, God didn't speak to me and tell me that's what's going on. But I've watched this stuff my whole life. I read these words and I'm like, well, that's got to be true. That's what it says. And then I watch these scenarios play out time and time and time and time again. And I'm like, how can we continue to act like it's not right in front of us? Let's be free. Yeah. I've made some dumb mistakes in my life. I've really messed myself up multiple times. And I stand here today with hardly a pain in my body because I've just learned to just be happy. Just forgive people around you. Move on with life. Don't be bitter. Sometimes it's hard. Sometimes it's easy. Just, just let the grace, the glory of God do its magic in you. But it's never going to happen as long as you're holding on to every little thing that's ever gone wrong. And by every little thing, I mean some of those are big things. By our human standards. I've suffered great loss in my life. I had to overcome great emotional hurdles to get to the place where I said, you know what? Life's too short to live like that. I'm going to be happy in Jesus. I'm not saying that it's not a big thing when you start, but I promise you, if you can ever find it in you by the grace of God to just give it to him and say, no more do I live as an oppressor or oppressed. Because if you can't forgive, you can't be forgiven. Yeah, that means that if you can truly forgive everybody around you and let go of your position as an oppressor, I believe that no matter whether people forgive you or not, you're not under that curse because Jesus came to forgive us <clears throat> regardless of what everybody else wants to do. But he gave us terms and conditions. We must go first. Yeah, he can't land in an unrepentant heart. But he can give you grace to do it. Amen? Amen. <clears throat> so right about now, I have to believe that the Holy Spirit is doing his job today. Um, you've already thought about things that you need to let go. You've already thought about 
things that you held on to. You've already thought about some things, and it's already scared some of you the idea of truly forgiving somebody. Trust me, I know the feeling. It's a hard one. It's already crossed your mind. It's You've already had to wrestle that tension. And even if you don't get it today, know this. God is good, and he will get you there. But I'm going to tell you right now, you will not pass this point until you deal with this. Whatever this is, whatever this thing that's holding you back, whether it be judgment or forgiveness or, or, or you know, whatever, whatever it is, you shall not pass go. It will, you will just groundhog day. We're going to get groundhog day in it until this is done. So just believe right now it doesn't have to feel good. It doesn't have to look good. It can be as ugly as I'll get out. You can be honest and say, God, I don't want to give you this, but I'm going to. As long as it's real, it will work. I promise you, I've seen people get healed going into baptism tanks. We're not doing baptism today. We're doing forgiveness. But I'm telling you, I've seen physical healings come out of things other than just praying for physical healing. And today is one of those days. Today is one of those days where if you can begin to let go of the things that are, are you are oppressing people with in your heart of hearts, if you can begin to let it go, you're going to begin. Even if it's just a tiny seed, you're going to feel a little bit of change. And then by faith, you're going to grab a hold to it. By hope, as we described, hope is you don't even see the pieces required for it to make sense yet. But by hope, you begin to say, I know that God is good because I've read his word and it says he is. And by faith and hope combining together, you are going to begin to walk in wholeness. Wholeness. If you will let God set you free, he will fix everything. There were things that I struggled with as lifelong um, physical ailments that God healed in this in this long this process I did with him one time where I was praying about these things and he said, just do the things I tell you to do. And he healed things I didn't even put on the list to pray for. Random, I know, right? But that's how this works. I had lifelong, like intense, like worse than anybody I've ever known or seen since then, allergies. Like a six shots a week when I was a kid. Sinus had a 24-7, just constant, constant, nothing worked. Nothing worked. I, I was asking God to heal me in certain areas. Didn't even think to put that one on the list. I'd lived with it for so long. But after eight months, I'm like, I don't have allergies. That's crazy. That was like 17 years ago. I haven't had allergies since then. It's, I didn't even ask him, but I began to walk in wholeness, healing with him, and it wasn't allowed to be there anymore. Come on. It's worth the fight, I promise you. And whatever identity you get out of holding on to these hurts and pains, it's not a good one. Whatever empowerment you think you have, it's not real. Whatever protection you think you have by holding on to hurts and pains and building walls because of it, it's not real protection. Ask Nebuchadnezzar if he was scared of their walls. Only one thing kept, you gotta recognize the Israelites were a tiny group of people in the Old Testament. They were a tiny, they were in numbers an inferior army to almost everyone around them. But they were the people who God fought with them. And they intimidated. They struck fear in the hearts of all the nations around them when they were right with God. Because they were the people who God fought with them. That's us. But you've got to ask yourself, are you willing to keep the terms and conditions? I want to tell you that all things were, com were completed in Christ. That is true. But what that really means is God, Christ, Jesus, our King, He made a way for there be sufficient grace made available for you to do what He said you could do. And He said, as you forgive others, you could be completely forgiven. This is a widespread problem. It's not just this room, but this is the only room I care about right now. And I trust, promise you, he's not liberating you so you can go fix everybody that you have on your list of people you need to forgive. It's not what he's doing. He's liberating you so that someone, somehow, somewhere can see 
a difference, a new light, a level of forgiveness, a level of forgiveness. And they'll be inspired by you. And one day, one day, they'll ask, how'd you do it? And you'll tell them this story. You'll take them back to these stones of remembrance. You'll say, you know, one day this, this uh, hillbilly preacher, he got up and he just started talking about this forgiveness stuff. And I don't know, it makes sense that day. And I went with it. And it changed my life. I can't make you do it. Jesus, before you, we come, we come before you, Lord, and we just open our hands. We extend before us, Lord, all the things that we know we are keeping people in bondage. We extend before us, Lord, all the things that we know we have held against people. This you, you are love, and you said you would, and they said that you would not keep an account of wrongs suffered. They said that you would have patient endurance. You are love. You are kind. You believe all things. You hope for all things. You are all good things. We give you all that is not of you in us, Lord. And we say they are forgiven. We forgive those who we perceive to have wronged us. Let us walk in their shoes, even figuratively, Lord. Let us walk in their shoes and see that they are doing the best they can do with the knowledge they have of you. And let us have compassion for them. Let us love them. Let us love them like you loved us long before we were lovely. Give us the grace, Lord, to walk in your conditions of this new covenant. You didn't come and institute the new covenant with these instructions so that you could judge us harshly later. You came to save the world. And we thank you, Lord Jesus, that we, we thank you, Lord Jesus, that we are going to find it in us today to give you the hurts and pains. We're going to find it in us today to let it go. It's some of it's real, some of it's not real. Whether it's real or not real makes no difference. We cannot hold on to it and keep people in bondage. And we just speak right now, Lord. I declare that as people are letting go of those that they have oppressed in their hearts, in their minds, in their lives, as people are letting go of those hurts and pains, that they are releasing that, as they are forgiving them truly, spiritually real, like really forgiving them. I just speak right now that some of the physical afflictions that are in their body begin to turn, begin to shift in the right direction because it has no place in them as long as they are forgiven. It has no place in them when they are forgiven of their sins. Arise and walk, he said, because your sins are forgiven. Let that be the day today. Let us begin to walk. Let, you said the spirit of the Lord would come upon us. And that we would be anointed to preach this gospel of, of reformation and freedom. That we would set the captives free. That we would set at liberty the oppressed. That we would, that the blind eyes would open. Lord, let, let the blind, let those who do not have eyes to see, let them see your goodness right now, Jesus. Let the deaf ears open in your name. Lord Jesus, you, the year of the Lord, acceptable year of the Lord is today. Set the captives free, Lord, in our hearts. We just speak that healing follows. Emotional healing, physical healing. Emotional healing, physical healing. Let it begin right now. Let it not even be a question of who healed us. Let it be a let it be a testimony unto the world around us of I let go of hurts and pains like Jesus said, and He for, forgave my sins, and I stood and walked like He did the man. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for this day. Continue to bear with us, Lord, as we figure this out in Your name. Let us be the shining lights unto this dark world, Lord Jesus. That we that we let us boldly come before your throne. Let us boldly walk out into this world and say, I am forgiven because I have forgiven. We thank you, Lord Jesus. We thank you, Lord. Continue to meet us in our time of prayer, Lord Jesus, at home, as we ride in the cars, as we go to work, as we do our shopping, as we play with our children, Lord. Let, let continue to reveal yourselves in the laughter of the children, in the, in the what would seem like mundane details of everyday life. Continue to reveal yourself in your goodness, in your glory. We thank you, Lord, for the forgiveness of sins. Teach us to be like you, Lord. 
In your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.